Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining today's Arches Developer Meeting. I'm really actually super stoked that so many of you decided to participate today. It looks like we've already got a great list of participants. So thanks in advance for joining us. Really appreciate that. Uh, my name is Dennis Withrich, and I'm the CEO of Farallon Geographics. Many of you probably recognize the name Farallon. We've been working on the Arches project for quite a number of years now. And uh, we had a internal conversation back early part of this year, back in, I guess, January or February. And one of the things we thought that'd be really great would be to start a conversation amongst developers in the Arches community. And by way of jogging your memory, we had a conversation uh, back in August, where we had our initial our initial Arches meeting. And although we wanted that to be done in person, uh, events conspired against us. And instead, we had an online meeting, uh, which I thought was really, really good. And it was great to get to meet people, hear what people are working on, uh, put fit names and faces together. So appreciated that. And at the tail end of that meeting back in August, we took a straw poll and it was, I think, pretty clear that people were interested in having a second meeting and that the second meeting should be a chance for members of the Arches community to share their work. And that's what we're going to do today. Uh, we're going to have three members of the community uh, talk to us about the work that they're doing with Arches. And uh, I'm actually super excited about that. Our format for today is going to be I think a bit um, less interactive and more presentational, primarily because we've got three different teams who want to show their work. And uh, it's just a bit unwieldy to have 30 odd folks chiming in um, in an in a ad hoc way. So we thought it would make sense to have this be more of a webinar presentation, at least initially. And the way this will work is we'll have three presentations. They'll each have about a half an hour to present their work, at the end of which we'll do a quick Q&A session. And I'd like to encourage people to type in their, Q, their questions into the Zoom tool, and that'll give me a chance to pluck out the questions and pose them to the speaker. And then we'll launch into the next meeting. At the end of the third presentation, if we've got a bit of time left and there's interest, I think it makes sense to open up to general dialogue then. So that's how we'll be that's how we'll be organized for the next hour and a half or so, uh, two hours or so. Um, despite the fact that everyone's on mute, please don't let that dissuade you from uh, chatting amongst one another. Like I said, posing questions, that would be really, really great. Uh, today's time is really all about seeing the work that our colleagues are doing. And I'd like to start by having um, Andy Jones, uh, who is with Historic England, start off with a presentation that he's working on for uh, historic England. And Andy, I bet you're ready to go. I'm going to hand off the conversation to you. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And I think that would put you in a position to actually start sharing um, your screen and starting your conversation. So without further ado, um, Andy Jones, why don't you take it off? Thanks very much, Dennis. Okay, so I've got to see how I can get this to work. Uh, so I can't present at the moment. Let me see if I can make you a presenter. Thank you. Okay, you are a host now, so you should be able to present. Yeah. <clears throat> there we go. Let's minimize that down. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Um, let me just get this presentation on the go. <clears throat> Can everyone still see that? 
Yes. Great. Okay. Um, so thank you. Yes, I'm, I'm just going to spend hopefully the next half hour, if I can keep it within half hour, please tell me off if I'm going to uh, go, going over. Um, just just to kind of give a brief intro to, to Warden, which is a project we've been working on for um, probably about 18 months or so now. Um, and it was uh, a project to replace a, an internal system at Historic England. So just just very briefly, then what what we do, uh, we we are a government uh, arms length body in in England. We work for the Department for Culture, Media and Sport, and and our role as an organisation is to really champion um, uh, historic places and, and raising the, the profile and the importance of, of heritage in England, um, identifying, protecting uh, our heritage and uh, including things like recommending uh, designations of, of sites for, for protection and also um, as well as uh, sort of doing more, more work in understanding historic places. Uh, we also support uh, change uh, such as providing help um, and advice to, to, to government on policy and also expertise at, at a local level within our um, local planning uh, planning authorities. So again, swiftly moving on, um, one of the tools that, that we've had over, over the years um, that, that's helped us on this task is uh, a system, um, it's called the Ancient Monuments Index for England, but but we know it internally as Amy, and and this is a, this is a, a, a very rich record of um, the the English historic environment, and has been a system that we've slowly accumulated over the years. Uh, it, it, it started off with sort of simple terrestrial models decades ago, and and has slowly been bolted onto with information about. Um, marine maritime um, uh, sites, uh, crashed aircraft, um, as well as activities that are occurring around um, to do with our investigation and, 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 and research. We use this tool to, to not only collect that uh, research um, and investigation work, but we also have used it for providing information. Uh, this information is provided to, to, to um, members of the public, commercial organisations, academics, um, as well as uh, for, for, for sort of wider government applications such as you know, national infrastructure projects, for instance. And the, the system itself has been collated, yeah, well over 20 years. The system itself is more than 20 years old, um, you know, has, has close to, if not over a million records in it and, and consisted of around 400 tables within the database. So, actually taking this uh this this system and migrating it was was quite a quite a, a huge undertaking for us and it's probably the reason why it why it took so long to get around to so this this was this was going to be the new home uh warden uh i can't, I can't tell i can't never remember what it, what it actually stands for because <laughs> it's a bit a little bit of an in joke but but it is a um uh, it's a keeper of the data now. I've put I'll put there a little asterisk to say that it's for now. We we have an ongoing program now where we are starting to to uh, hand off this national data set to to the local um, historic environment records around England, who who will become uh, the, the the owners of that data, and um, the system will move more towards a, um, a a research tool that will allow us to collect data and, and send that off. Um, to, to the respective local uh, local authorities, the the system itself we, we we've delivered a second version of it already. The first version we started in in four 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 one um, last year, uh, and that was released earlier this year in the summertime. And since then we've released the second version at, at, at five. So we 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 spent the last six months or so upgrading that um, and adding additional functionality. Um, as with all great Arches applications, it all starts with with models. So um, Phil Collal in in our heritage data team spent um, quite a bit of time working through the intricacies of those four hundred tables and and developing for us uh, seven. There's actually eight, but seven target models that we've populated um, with that data. Uh, there we go. So yeah, I just wanted to really start off saying data, data wrangling, as we as we sort of came came to call it, was was quite a monumental process. In, in the end, we we managed to migrate across and, and generate around eight hundred thousand um, resource instances. And you know, this is a little flavour of of what Chantel spent many many um, sort of weeks building up. So. 
in order to allow us to, to extract that data, you know, do the ETL process of extracting the data, doing, you know, doing cleansing, checking the data, um, presenting it in a way for the business to, to also check it, and then also to transform it into uh, CSV or, or, or JSON if, if uh, the data structure is slightly more complicated with a bit more hierarchy. So really didn't want to kind of glaze over that and go on to uh, the, the kind of the, the actual application itself without uh, talking about that. <clears throat> so apologies to the diagram, it is a little bit of a kind of a little bit of an eyesore there, but really it's, this is a kind of a very high level component diagram of, of, of what we've been working to and, and what Warden currently sits at. And I've highlighted um, uh, five main areas that we have been developing and integrating with uh, over over the last couple of years. And I'm just gonna swiftly move, move on, give rest everyone's eyeballs on a Friday evening or morning. Um, and move to this so this this again it, it just shows that the, the main areas that we concentrated our work on obviously in the middle is is the warden application itself where um you know the, the, the data work was happening uh the the arches extension work around data types functions those kind of um uh, standard ways of extending arches also along the start at the bottom, we, we had a number of requirements around uh, being able to do um, import export of that of that data. So importing in order to allow us to update those records on mass as as the the accessioning work progresses over the next few years. Um, and also as part of the advisory work that we do, we need to be able to um, generate very large volumes of, of reports um, for, for organizations. And sometimes, yeah, like we said, there, there can be national projects. Um, we we are an Esri house, uh, so we we ha we have quite a few workflows within the the Esri ArcGIS uh, stack. So we had to make sure that that the warden, uh, sorry, the data that was in ward and was able to be um, accessible um, by that. Um, we could also do some kind of querying between them and also allow our GIS to be able to help us digitize some of the, 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 the features that we're going to be uh, added into into Warden. And then along the top, um, the Heritage Gateway, we, we were going to, um, Warden is an internal system. Uh, we don't we don't um, publish the, the user interface, but we do allow access to a subset of the data through a site called the Heritage Gateway um, that we provide um, a service for now. And then the last one was um, we needed to be able to integrate with our um, our mapping services that, that we host at ArcGIS Online, and also to be able to have system monitoring through uh, through application insights in Azure. So again, swiftly moving on, the 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 actual uh, infrastructure, the deployment infrastructure that we've got going is, is pretty simple. Um, it's it is designated into to logical zones from from public facing down to internal, um, simply because we wanted to make sure that we had flexibility in how we did deploy it. The the system itself is on two two virtual machines. They're both uh, four core sixteen gigabyte uh, servers. They're Windows servers, so we are a Windows. Um, we are a Windows house and Microsoft stack house, and we use Azure to host all of all our uh, virtual machines. So yeah, so those two machines, they're both the same. They're four core 16 uh, gig machines with SSDs and, and attached storage for, for backups uh, of the database and uh, for Elasticsearch. Um, so the, the front end is only accessible internally, but um, the, the data we can get through the heritage gateway, um, uh, which will be querying Elasticsearch. Okay, so these these are the sort of six areas that kind of tie into to what I just showed you, and I'll go through those um, uh, sort of one by one. I will try and cut out and, and uh, of, of the presentation show you um, little kind of demos, but, but there's quite a lot to cover, so it may be it may be a bit brief. <clears throat> okay, so. Um, one of the big bits of work that we're doing over the last couple of years between the two versions that we've released um, is is all around accessibility and as a as a public body uh, in England we we have to um, we have to adhere to uh, a law that came in in 2018 around public sector bodies accessibility regulations um, 
we need to ensure now that all of our internal and external applications are accessible to to people with disabilities and and where they you know, where 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 we where we do that really needs we need to sort of do reasonable adjustment to to any applications that that we do adopt and those um, requirements are really kind of centered around the WCAG guidelines so we have to um, we have to adhere to um, the, the 2.1 WCAG guidelines at AA or greater level of accessibility um, where where we don't we need to provide uh, a statement uh, and, a, and a road with a roadmap of of when we will become compliant so that's a big bit of work that we've um, been doing so we need to make sure we meet those requirements so i will i will attempt to pop out of the presentation and actually show this so see how we go here <clears throat> okay so this is the landing page um what i was going to just briefly talk about before diving into it was um, one of the big bits of work that we did up front was was um, going through the whole site and just ensuring that um, the, 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 the HTML5 implementation was semantically correct. So just ensuring all the HTML5 elements were correctly used um, and correctly structured in the, in the right order. And we also had to make sure that uh, the whole site had, had been through uh, W3C validation um, there, because there were a few elements that, 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 that weren't. The main reason for this was to enable things like screen readers and um, uh, kind of the tools that, that, that are used in the browser to be able to correctly navigate through the, the document and, and pass the HTML where it didn't conform, sometimes would cause issues with those screen readers uh, uh, and tools. So things like um, labeling, ARIA labeling, just going through and making sure, double checking that they all had them, making sure the forms and labels, um, yeah, oh, sorry, forms and uh, so the input things are labeled correctly so that we can navigate through and the screen readers could, could see what was um what was happening some of the tools that we use things like um the wave plugin that was it, that, that's a really good uh kind of tool to just identify areas where that there may be uh, things to have a look at and and uh, errors to, to correct i mean i will say when we go in that that we've not finished this by any means you know we're, we've we've definitely made a massive inroads into it but there's still some way to go <clears throat> okay so one of the things, so welcome to Warden. Um, so one of the things that um, we are quite keen on being able to do, and certainly we've had some internal users that have questioned this, is, is uh, kind of font sizing, being able to zoom and making sure that it is a responsive site. Um, so I'll just kind of give a demonstration that, you know, we can now, as, as things increase in size, it, it, it tends to, um, kind of resize a little bit uh, more um, more as expected uh, so it, it, it's easier to follow and also means that the screen readers are still able to kind of go through it in the correct order um, like I said there's still some work to do so certainly here it's quite a complex page um, which makes it a little bit difficult to, to show um, some of the results we have got a little module that we've used for for previous exports before we had the exports in 5.1. We had a little tool here that we added, which allows us to, I guess, see slightly better um, view of it when we are zoomed in. Uh, one of the one of the parts of accessibility is that if if um, if what you're using isn't accessible, then you need to be able to provide another means for for doing that. So this kind of fills that gap while we're still looking at how we can can work with that search interface. Uh, okay. So the other things that um, we've looked at is to do with um, uh, kind of uh, so also with visual but you will see actually it looks quite different there are there's quite a, a few differences in the coloring so we've had to work quite uh, quite a lot for, uh, on contrast ratios contrast ratios is quite an important thing as well for for partially sighted um, people being able to differentiate between the different colors has been quite important um, and also things like just little indicators to show a little bit better what what the state is sometimes some of the color contrasts uh, make it quite difficult so just having little indicators and things like that is is important 
Another thing is also navigation. So um, not being able to use the mouse is quite a big thing. So we need to just ensure that uh, that keyboard support is in place. So being able to navigate round, making sure you can kind of get to all the various um, parts of the site and, 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 you know, kind of open them up. Uh, it is. So yeah, so just be able to navigate into trees, up and down trees, um, is is you know was was a good bit of work. So Paul did a, did a lot of work on this, going through and making sure that 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 worked correctly. Um, so yeah, I'm just looking at the time. I'm not going to go too much into it, but you you will get a flavour that it is quite a bit different, but at the same time still provides the same functionality that we're used to. <clears throat> So the next thing that um, we spend a lot of time on is just looking at some of the extensions. So data types and, and functions and widgets for, for workflows of the users that we're going to be using the application itself. Um, we didn't look at report templates, cards or plugins at this stage. That was, um, that was not necessary for what we were doing to, uh, uh, for now. Um, so I'm going to try and jump out again and just kind of give a demo of what we were looking at there too. Uh, go away, Mr. Pop down there. there we are. Okay, so um, when when people go and develop, uh, sorry, create new records, the, the the first thing they tend to do is they tend to use a a British National Grid coordinate, which which we have here in England. Um, so what they wanted to be able to do is put that in and it do a number of things and prepare a number of the records without a number of the cards without having to go away and do that separately. So um, for that, what we've done. Is if I just get a, a British National Coordinate. Um, we can go in here, set up a reference. So you can see here is the widget for our British National Point, um, grid point. Uh, we can enter that in. It does a bit of checking. There is a, there is a function there to convert that, um, which is done in the view model and then allows us to, to create the record. So what it's going to be doing in the background is actually going to be running a number of functions that will generate geometries and also do a lookup against one of our ArcGIS online services to, to populate some of the data. Um, what I do have to do whenever we run this is I do actually have to refresh the page because it doesn't update the tree here. So if you can see now we've we, we've got a point. It's gone away and it's drawn the point, which is relatively you know, straightforward. Um, we've got the we've got the grid coordinate there, and also we've gone away and and picked up some of the administrative boundaries that that um, intersect with that site. So what often would normally happen now is the the um, if the user would come in and they would look to modify that feature, put in another um, uh, polygon or something that a little bit more detailed around that. Uh, oh, that's helpful. Zoom right out. Let's do pop that around there. So save that, update that. And what it would do, um, if there was any change to the grid reference, it would update that. And similarly, if it, if there was any other intersection with the related areas, if it was a larger uh, digitization, then that would update. Um, the final thing that we uh, looked at as a function for now is, is, is we have an internal indexing system for our records that we're maintaining from Amy. So whenever a new record is created, it will go and generate this, um, this uh, card for us and, and, and look up the, the next um, index reference in the, in, in the line. So that's a really brief sprint through uh, through that. So I'm going to dash back to my presentation. <clears throat> um, so I'm really going to glance over this relatively quickly. Um, one of the things uh, that we had to do is obviously for the for the Heritage Gateway provide a public interface into our system to do that. Um, and we, uh, in order to be able to support it, we developed a, a .NET Core service that that allowed us to do that. The all of the um, so I should I should really describe it. The, the, the gateway is a is a way of searching numerous um, uh, discrete uh, data sets around uh, all of the local uh, historic England. Uh, sorry. Uh, heritage environment records in the UK. So you can see here, there are a number of them. A lot of them are national 
law but a great many of them are, are local records so you can go and type in one search uh, value and it'll go off and search them all and, and and collate those results so we've we've created a new one here for for warden which is which is this one here um, so we've implemented that service it is a soap service it's a standard interface through soap uh, but what we have done is we've we've built onto that a um, uh, an additional interface, which I was going to show, but I'm looking at the time, so I'm not going to go into too much, but it allows us to uh, um, search that, integrate and, and use Elasticsearch to provide our data. Um, so again, in order for us to, to maintain and manage the system and, and, and work with the operations team to make sure that it's up and running, okay, what we needed to do was ensure that we had a, a had, had good monitoring on it. And, and for that, we turned to, um, to the implementation that um, uh, Microsoft are using with with Open Census and more recently uh, Open Telemetry, and this will allow us to be able to look at the system as it stands, how it's running. We can look at logs um, while it's running and and collect some really useful information uh, to, to to help kind of inform us as to, to what's going on. Um, so for that, um, I was going to very briefly show how we in implemented that. It's a really straightforward process, actually. It's auto instrumentation. So it, it really is a case of um, just effectively applying the packages to your application. And then within the settings pi file, you, you simply uh, configure the middleware, which is here, which looks at the requests. You, you bring in some integration, which, which looks at the logging and make sure it, it transmits the logs, transmits the requests and the traffic, um, and also uh, transmits information about the, post, uh, the Postgres requests, and then simply configuring your, your, logging, uh, your logging handler and formatter there. That is all we needed to do. And just from that, we were able to get a, a huge amount of information. I must say at this point, it's really important that, that if we're for this, because it, it uses the logging, it's important not to use print statements uh, in it. And I know um, so we've gone through and had to change a lot of our stuff to use logging. And I've seen um, various moves to, to, to making sure we use that a bit more. But what that gives us is, is just from simply that bit of code, we're able to see what's going on in the, in the, across the whole application, what traffic's going between, what dependencies, where there's issues. You can see here, there's some few issues happening between certain elements of the application that allow us to kind of tie in any, any um, information that's been raised by anyone on the business side. And that again, we can go into that a little bit more. We can look at some of the server response times, how the operation's working, um, what the server request timing's happening. You can see in the, the graph on the left that we've got a you spike so something is taking a little bit of time which might lead you to think that there's something going on and if we look then in the logs on the right you can see that, that we've got a we've got a slight issue with one of those functions something's obviously happening there that um, uh, is causing those so we can go and look at that uh, with a bit more information uh, oh I've gone away from the presentation that's not what I wanted to do um, <clears throat> so for the the, the last two things I was going to talk about there was a great deal of um, uh, kind of there's a need for us to develop resource views and for for those of you who aren't familiar with resource views it's a way of us to kind of to, to, to write into the database um, some views that flatten that graph structure that that Arches uses uh, underneath in order to generate some database objects which we can plug into um, for, uh, for for integrations um, we we actually spent quite a lot of time doing this because we could see the benefit in some of the things we were we were looking at and some of the other systems we have that that could al allow them to um, connect in fairly easily to to these standard database objects and and pull out the data. We we did have um, well, I, I'm not going to show you what what it looks like just for now. So I'm conscious of the time, but um, we we did generate quite a few. It was about 90 in total, which is a lot. Some of them are quite simple. Some of them are more complex, um, and they provide information um, for for the things I'm about to show you now. So I mentioned earlier about bulk reporting. Uh, we as, as I said, we we get contacted to to uh, to get information about what's in the national data. There. And sometimes, if it is a uh, very big, um, well, it could be it could be of any size. But if it is a particularly large request, then um, we need to be able to provide huge numbers of reports and, and data to to those third parties. So um, 
we we looked around we didn't have much money for for, for actual kind of reporting solutions so um what we decided to do actually was to develop um uh, actually an etl workflow in 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 talent that allowed us to very quickly tie into all those various elements of the models generate uh, an html report and, and the way it was written allowed us to customize that very quickly so we can we can re remove and add in that information um, very simply and also we have multiple types of report for the different requirements that we might have with uh, with reporting um, and so really onto the, the kind of the last bit um, that I was going to talk about and that was the the, the RGIS tool integration so at the moment, uh, I know it's kind of, it's a work in progress, but at the moment there's there's no uh, sort of standard connection be between the two systems. Um, we we predominantly at the moment use ArcGIS uh, 10.3, unfortunately, we have got an upgrade grade path, but at that point, um, <clears throat> we, th there's not, there wasn't a whole lot that we could do. So what we have done is we've, um, we've used those materialized views to to be able to generate views or fairly simple views of all of the spatial data in the database that uh, allows us to for the desktop solution stream out uh, with a direct database connection into the desktop environments so the users can um, access that data fairly rapidly it's quite a lot of data um, so services feature services within ArcGIS don't really um, Sometimes they don't perform that well um, using this approach. So, we what we have what we have what we have is a, an additional process for exporting some of that spatial data from the views and distribute it round to our to our various systems. Um, and then um, just over on the left here, we've we've there are a number of kind of workflows that we had we have within some of our teams that require us to be able to kind of join some of the searches that we do within Warden and have that influence some of the spatial data selections that we're doing and and really the the, the kind of the, the the way we were able to do it relatively quickly is to kind of um uh, get on the back of the the export the csv export so in the early version we we wrote one that did it uh, for us based on the existing search uh, but later on obviously with version 5 it comes with that export functionality so we're able to do a search you know that rich search within the Arches user interface, export out a CSV of that search that represents it and then use that CSV to influence what mapping we're able to then select and, and potentially enhance with um, you know, some intersections or if someone has uh, a polygon that it kind of gives a specific search area, we can then integrate that and, and create a, a spatial data set based on that. Um, and then some of the other tools are a little helper to such as if we need to do some fairly um, complex digitizing of, of polygons, we can do that here and export a geojson representation of that for importing into the record. So if we can't do it within the user interface of Arches, that allows us uh, to do it. <clears throat> so that was um, fairly rapid. I do apologize. I did talk quite quickly, but there, there's, there's, there's a lot to cover um, and I know I'm just kind of glancing over the surface of it um, but uh, but yeah that's pretty much everything so I've just stuck within I've got 28 minutes here on my timer so I'm quite pleased with that um, I guess the, the questions now hey Andy that was really great and uh, you covered a lot of ground some really interesting material and and thanks for the presentation uh, there were a couple questions in the chat section and uh, one about accessibility that was answered by um, one of your colleagues. Um, there is a question outstanding though and that is about the data wrangling bits and the tools that you used, you and Chantal used to kind of get wrestle the data to the ground in the transition, I guess the, the, the extraction and the, and the, the processing from Amy into Warden. Could you just spend a moment talking about that? Sure. So yes, FME was was the the, the main tool set that we used. Um, I know that um, the the Heritage Data team who did some of the clean the, the cleansing work used um, uh, Open Refine, I think, for for a number of their tasks. But we we really relied on FME to. Um, 
to do that we found it was a far more flexible you, we could very rapidly change the workflows to allow, to allow us to extract from the tables reorder it go in and manipulate it um, use it to build you know json structures uh, uh and, and csv files and it was also really good because it had um uh, full spatial data support because uh, obviously it's it, i think it's its um, origins are in, in kind of GIS world. So it, it kind of covered both those areas in terms of being able to pull out all that data and also do the spatial uh, data transformation. And it was pretty fast as well. Um, you know, we, we, we were dealing with a lot of data and it had to go through a lot of processes to do it. So being able to parallelize it um, and, and use, you know, fairly beefy machines to do it was, 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 was really good. So it was a good experience, if not long um, and um, yeah, quite, quite laborious at, at, at occasions. Yeah. Well, underestimate data manipulation and, and data transformation at your peril. I mean, Absolutely. You're, going to, you're going to move something from it a legacy system into any new target data management system, arches or whatever, uh, it's a lot of work. And uh, 20 years of data management on Amy um, only makes it that much more challenging. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, having, having what is effectively in there about six different databases kind of shoehorned together, um, trying to work out how they all join up and make sure that we're capturing the data that we actually do need, leaving behind the data that we don't need because it's you know it's kind of lost its meaning in the histories of you know the, the, the mists of time so that 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 was quite difficult we had to do that process quite a bit so obviously we would pull all the data out check it find it was wrong have to do it again and having that tool the flexibility of very quickly spinning up different sections different checks it was it was um really useful that, yeah that that's cool um, just in the interest of time, um, I'm going to suggest that we move on to our, our next presentation, which will be uh, something I've been looking forward to, a conversation about Arches and Docker and Kubernetes, and really kind of, a, I think, a nod towards thinking about Arches in production. This is a presentation from Sarah Byrne and Phil Weir at Flax and Teal, and um, I think Sarah's going to start. So Sarah, um, I'm going to make you the host. Um, if you could make Phil the host, um, okay. that would be great because he has um, all of the presentations. I'm just going to, to do a bit of an intro to us and the instances. Okay. Uh, I will we'll do that. Let's see if I can figure out. Thanks, uh, tell us. Okay, let's see here. Um, Phil, are you able to share your screen? Uh, let me have a go here. I'm just uh, find my screen first. Um, <laughs> there we go. There we go. Uh, oh, yes, there we go. Okay, is that visible there? Yeah, that's perfect. Okay, great. Um, so yes, as, uh, as you were saying, Dan, thank you very much. Um, Sarah's going to uh, start with a little bit of a, an uh, intro. Um, so uh, I guess, Sarah, um, did you want to start uh, with a uh, bit of a background and then uh, I'll um, get the sites up as you're talking. Yep, that sounds good. Thanks very much, Phil. Um, so just to give you a brief overview of who Flax and Teal are, um, I'm sure many of you haven't really come across us yet. Um, we're an open source focused um, software company based in Belfast in Northern Ireland. Uh, and we primarily work within um, the data management and engineering fields internationally. Um, but we thought that the way that um, this open source platform 
uh, uses data really suited um, our skill set and we're really excited to be uh, part of the community. So I'm Sarah and the product manager for Arches. Um, I actually have a background in uh, medieval academic history, primarily in the history of medicine um, and have been a volunteer for uh, a number of the um, cultural heritage organizations here in, in Northern Ireland as well. So uh, I feel like I understand at least some of the pains um, in, in some of the organizations. Um, so I was very keen to just thrust this forward. Um, so we have on the call as well, Phil, who's uh, the director and founder of Flax and Tail. Um, his background's in um, mathemat mathematical modeling of sea ice in the Antarctic. Um, and he's also a very early adopter of Kubernetes, which I'll hand over to him to speak about in more depth after a quick look at our current projects. So, Phil, if you could just go to the Ireland instance, please. Yeah, sure. Um, Okay, so I'm not going to go into a lot of depth. Um, you all know what Arches does. Um, this particular instance, which is on um, Kubernetes infrastructure, um, was an instance um, that was set up as a demo uh, for our customers in NI and the Republic of Ireland. Um, so all of the data on this is open data at the moment. Um, so it was a testing instance really for me um, to alter the metadata and um, to work with customers to show how some of their assets could fit into um, the Arches framework. Um, it's currently using the Psydoc CRM at present, um, but we have been uh, working a lot with um, assets that have um, been relocated from one part of Northern Ireland to another. So we're working that into the metadata as well, as well as shipwrecks, um, which is going to be a really big part of one of our um, customers' data sets. Um, so uh, another one of our instances that is particularly interesting is um, Anthropos. So this is very new. <laughs> uh, we've only really just got started with this one. Um, so again, on Kubernetes infrastructure, uh, it's an instance set up for the New Zealand Antarctic Heritage Trusts. Um, and I'm currently working with them on um, their database to advise on the CRM going forward. Um, so I'll just hand over to Phil for uh, the main event. I know that you all want to know about Kubernetes. Uh, cool. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, so uh, I'm uh, going to have to uh, apologise. This is going to uh, inevitably be um, a little bit uh, cody. Um, and I know that's, that's not necessarily um, floats everyone's boat, but... In a wonderful pun related segue. Um, oh, sorry, while I work out how to use Zoom again here. Um, sorry, bear with me one second here. Get rid of a couple of these. Any data? Oh, that's right. I moved off the presentation to show that. I forgot that. So if I go back to uh, where I was here. There we go. So um, probably a more useful title in the uh, in the email that Dennis sent around. Um, but I thought uh, maybe to try and capture a little bit of the flavour of what we're doing. Um, we're trying to uh, use some of these tools that um, we've got a experience using in other settings and seeing if we can get some um, benefit for pairing with pairing them with arches and if that's something that's useful to other people too. So um, first question um, that some of you who've been watching on the list probably have is um, what's Kubernetes and um, I'm aware that uh, some of you will have come across this um, and potentially have used it. Some of you have probably heard of it. Um, aware that it obviously is uh, primary developers meetup, so it's one of those kind of buzzwords that tends to come up a lot in the industry generally. So um, 
the other question that I'm going to try and answer um, is why that's actually relevant to arches. And um, I'm going to start with the first and try and do a bit of a, a kind of whistle stop tour of what a Kubernetes is and to get, get people um, at least able to see why we're uh, having certain conversations or, or what the chat's about. So <clears throat> a few practical points with Arches. Um, first of all, it's uh, well standardized and open. Um, that's one of the things that we really quite like about it. There's a number of ways um, that we can use this type of infrastructure tooling. And I guess I should really clarify that the main purpose that we're looking for in Kubernetes is trying to uh, run processes in the cloud. I think that's really the key, um, key concept. And there's lots of ways of doing that. Um, that could be setting up um, VMs manually. It could be setting up VMs automatically. It could be running Docker Compose in the cloud um, on AWS or Azure um, or something like Kubernetes. So what is it that's, that attracts us to that? So well standardized and open, this is something that um, from the outset uh, was trying to solve some of the challenges of having very different environments that people are having to deploy tools like Arches onto. Um, it's something that lets you get to that next point relatively standard way. So say things like, uh, I suddenly want to think about how I scale out um, across multiple um, machines. How do I do that? And uh, part of the idea of Kubernetes is that there's been a kind of brick wall in some ways, um, traditionally, that uh, you start having to think about operations and, and cloud ops and things like that, where you really want to just think about how you put together a bit of software, how it works, how it interacts, and not be um, having to deal with um, Azure management on a case-by-case -case basis. So it makes that, that flow a bit more straightforward. It's also something that's quite well structured. Um, it did come out of Google originally, but it's been handed off and it's got quite big buy-in from uh, most of the major um, IT players, um, particularly Microsoft. And um, it's something that um, has been relatively widely adopted by organizations that don't tend to work together. Um, so for example, Amazon, Microsoft, and Google. Um, it allows us, and this is something particularly, um, we're a, an SME, um, so for our, for our benefit, having our operations processes, things like how do we set up a new stack, how do we get a series of VMs up, how do we get load balancing working, that sort of thing, it keeps it quite standard. And um, there's a perception that Kubernetes can be quite complicated coming to it for the first time. We've actually found this standardizing benefit means that we've been able to use it with our junior developers as well um, and get them up to speed and get them being able to do basic um, basic functionality too. So, <clears throat> uh, and one thing that's from a very pragmatic point is it's increasingly standard for um, a number of government departments um, and it's something that we see come up quite regularly nowadays in um, tender opportunities and so forth as a, a kind of basic expectation. Um, GDS are quite big in it, and um, I'm aware that's that's not restricted to the UK either. Lots of cases around the world that that's the case for. Um, on a technical level, um, so <clears throat> uh, YAML, you'll see a few examples of this going forward. I'm sure some of you are um, very familiar with it. Um, some of you um, may not have come across it so often, uh, but um, it's a consistent way of us uh, having documentation. Um, it is a superset of um, JSON, so effectively things that you can represent in JSON, you can represent in YAML, um, and it's a little bit easier to read. But that tends to be the, the definitions that will turn into an actual running piece of infrastructure um, tends to be in YAML. This is something that works with all the major cloud vendors, as I mentioned, but it also works on VMs. And it's something that you can, in fact, if you've got a bunch of old machines, you can even set it up on that. And there's a lot of work at the moment going on uh, to, to have even Raspberry Pi based deployments where you can fill your house with Raspberry Pis and have them all operating together in this way. Um, it works quite nicely with standard flows. Um, so 
we tend to use it a lot with GitLab, but also uh, works well with GitHub um, and other uh, CI solutions. Um, and that means that you change a piece of code or a developer changes a piece of code and the next thing they know it's running live and there's a nice audit trail and it's followed through in Git and no one's had to do any manual steps, um, which makes it obviously much harder to, to track and audit uh, in that case. The key, two key points of this, one is having everything recorded um, so that there's no ambiguity um, as to who's doing what um, and what infrastructure there is up there. The other is you don't want to have to think about servers uh, if you're a developer and if you're hitting uh, limits of servers or need to scale past them, Kubernetes abstracts that away. And I can talk a bit more about that in questions if that's helpful but it'll come through a little bit as we're talking. Um, it's also great for complex groups of tools. So we often tend to do uh, Python-based processing of let's say um, maybe a machine learning algorithm that we want to uh, deploy alongside a web framework or uh, potentially a simulation or engineering um, process. And Kubernetes gives us nice straightforward clean ways of saying here's five things that need to come up together and uh, it, and here's uh, the number of each of them that we want. Here's how much um, priority we want to give to them and so forth. And that's all encoded and not things that we're having to manually do. Um, highly recommend looking at this. It's a little bit old now, but um, it's going to be much more uh, visually engaging than I suspect I will. And um, it gives a walkthrough. It is an actual serious guide to Kubernetes. Um, I love it, it's fantastic. Um, but someone sat down and thought, well, actually, how can we um, take some of these ideas, abstract them and put them into um, a nice walkthrough uh, discussion? And uh, it's interspersed with technical drawings. So if you're thinking of Christmas presents for your kids, um, you probably want to take those pages out. I'll um, only touch on this one relatively briefly, um, mainly so that if there's any questions, we can come back to this, you know it's here. But uh, along the bottom, um, we have these nodes. These nodes are VMs. They might be VMs in Azure. They might be VMs in AWS. They might be um, on your computer. And Kubernetes looks after everything on the bottom left. So everything on that one side of that dotted line, it um, looks at how to put it all together and tries to abstract those problems away from you as much as possible. On the top right, um, you have the processes that you want to run. You tell Kubernetes and it just works out how to run them, where to run them and how to keep them up. And if they start looking, start looking sick, it'll um, try and heal them. And if they fall over, it'll bring them back up. If you're wanting to play around with Kubernetes, um, a great tool is Minikube. You can run that on your local machine and it gives you a full featured um, cloud-like deployment, but you can run it in one virtual machine on your desktop and uh, experiment and see how these things go. We haven't tried this with our Arches deployment yet, um, but interested in feedback if you do. And the final bit of tooling I want to mention is called Helm. And this is kind of the magic bit where Helm is a way of sharing templated applications. And that could be Postgres or it could be um, CCAN, for those of you who know CCAN, uh, it could be a um, particular application, um, that a full SaaS application. And we have pretty much all of our projects, uh, we will have our infrastructure definitions in this format. And that means that we can give it specific contextual values and all of the things it needs to know, like what can talk to what, what security things lie between these two processes, what uh, number of processes we want um, of Postgres or of Redis, um, how many um, different uh, storage uh, containers we need, that sort of thing, is all stored in, in that templated way. And we can fire up three development environments very quickly, for example. So bringing it back to Arches, um, we've got some first steps here. And um, you'll see 
uh, that we've got a series of um, hopefully familiar looking names. Uh, this is, as I say, kind of first steps. We're just running, in most cases, one instance of each uh, thing. Um, key ones to point out, obviously, Elasticsearch and CouchDB. Um, we've got a Postgres server running. Um, in fact, that will be running <coughs> PostGIS. And uh, we've got RabbitMQ um, alongside uh, NFS server for handling storage, so we can upload things to this. Um, and Arches, and it's, this is a really important point, um, Kubernetes pushes us to try and make as much of what we're doing stateless as possible. That means we can effectively scale it easily. So here we have um, Arches itself, um, and we've got our static assets in the container, that's something we might want to change. But um, Arches itself in Django is um, stateless, so we can scale that and say to Kubernetes, actually, we want five of these, and it'll go off and make that happen. Um, just to demystify a bit of what's going on in the background there, uh, Nginx, um, as a simple example, uh, we have, I mentioned YAML, and this is kind of a boiled down version where we've stripped out some of the boilerplate, some of the, the kind of standard stuff. And um, I think this is almost enough to get a web server running in Kubernetes. So we have a pod, um, which is uh, Kubernetes takes quite a strong wheel based analogy um, for various reasons. Uh, so a pod, uh, what we have are, uh, in this case, one container that it will run. And we have a service which uh, encapsulates that idea of okay, maybe I've got uh, five Nginx instances running and I want to load balance between them. So services called Nginx and Kubernetes will magically redirect to each of these individual containers. I also mentioned that Kubernetes can self-heal. Um, so <clears throat> how does it do that? Well, actually what we have is this idea of a deployment. When we create a deployment, we maybe have one, two, three, four, five replicas, or maybe we have auto-scaling, uh, even better. And uh, we say each of those will be able to spin up containers that look like this. For those of you who are familiar with cloud infrastructure, um, that might be like an auto-scaling group, something like that. And um, that's enough for us to say, okay, we want uh, five Nginx instances that load balance between them, one, three, seven, and effectively these two bits of um, definition are enough. Of course we can store that in Git which means it's versioned and we can even if we really want to put it into continuous integration so that every time we change it our Kubernetes uh, cluster as we call it will automatically update. So if we uh, wanted to change something about our definitions that we push it to Git and the next thing we know there it is um, on our development site um, or uh, live site if we merge it through. Um, just because I'm aware we need some pictures in this, um, I've got a picture here of some of I mentioned and um, Helm is a bit like a package manager really for uh, Kubernetes. So there's a few of um, the Helm charts as they call them or packages that you can fire onto a Kubernetes cluster and effectively you give it a set of values and you say, okay, I want my, I don't know, um, what have we got there? It's artifactory instance um, or airflow for those of you who do uh, workflows. And uh, you'll give it specific uh, values that you want to customize. And all of the actual structure of that application is contained in that package. So you can uh, launch it in fairly quickly. Um, that works by pairing your configuration, which might be quite short. So effectively we could say, okay, let's bring up a series of Arches instances. Each of them will have um, a short bit of config and then all of these standard uh, bits of YAML that say, okay, we want Django running here with these variables. We want um, uh, Redis running here with these variables. It'll put those together and turn those into an actual running thing on the cloud um, in say, for example, Azure AKS. Um, I've mentioned continuous integration. I just wanted to kind of highlight that, that um, that's something where we can uh, push it, test it, and see it come uh, out live. Um, 
but in particular with Kubernetes, uh, it gives us a way of when we push it by default or change the container that it's going to pull in. So this is all, all Docker containers. I think that's probably something I should have emphasized earlier. Uh, so once our new Docker container is built, um, GitLab, for example, will do that um, without really any significant configuration. Um, it will push it to Kubernetes and that will do a progressive rollout. So we're not even thinking about downtime. It will wait until each uh, of our uh, instances is stable, each of our uh, processes or replicas or whatever we want to call them is stable before closing down the old version. So it's sensible enough not to switch everything off when we upgrade, uh, but to, to let it happen progressively and roll it out. So a few considerations. Um, again, this is something that probably is going to be picked up in discussion, uh, if not this evening again. But creating new Arches projects, we want to um, have a bit of a think about that. We've kind of got a flow, as, as you've seen. We've, we've tried this with two. And um, we were even able to get, I think, 5.1 up within, within 24 hours, I think it was. Uh, we'd, we were running our 5.1 upgrade. And um, that went largely fine. A few, few teething issues, but uh, generally fine. Um, so we're kind of getting that flow going. Uh, looking at how we handle static assets uh, in a way that fits with Kubernetes. Um, without uh, making things complicated on the back end. Storage, I showed very briefly NFS there. There's lots of different ways that we can deal with storage. We also use MinIO in other circumstances, um, which uh, allows it a bit like um, Azure storage containers or AWS buckets. Um, but for the moment, we're using um, Network File Server and that does the job nicely. Um, we have to think a little bit about DNS because obviously something's got to point into this. Kubernetes does a great job of handling that uh, inward bit, but we do have to think how do we how do we point our site to end up at the right bit of Kubernetes, uh, or at least at the front door of Kubernetes, and then we have to instruct it where to go from there. Auto scaling something that if we've got different types of metrics metrics coming out of an application, we can say okay now we need to have ten processes instead of five. Um, and that's not something that we have to do in a very simplistic way either. Um, so that's something that's worth discussion. Maintenance tasks. This is one that we've hit a few times where we need to run a command. Kubernetes gives us ways of basically running, running a command on an individual process and kind of jumping in and saying, okay, I need to run this Python task here. But um, that's maybe something that needs a deep dive at some point. Backups. Um, so where do we put our database, for example? How does it get synced? How is that getting backed up? Where is that getting backed up? How do we give a sensible configuration that if someone wants to take this and use it, that they aren't having to think about that as an afterthought? And upgrading. So I mentioned we did the 5.1 upgrade fairly quickly, which is a positive sign, but we want to think about a little bit about that. Oh, that's it. There we go. Um, and uh, see where we can go from there. Um, so I'm going to do a quick summary. Um, how am I for, sorry, I missed the start time there. Uh, Dennis, how am I for time here? I guess that must be nearly half an hour. Uh, Phil, you've got a few more minutes, so. Okay, great. Thank you. So I'll uh, do a quick survey of some of the code. This is still quite rough and ready. Um, so we, we are iterating. Um, but the key points for us with Kubernetes saying, why do we want to insert this layer between, uh, for us at least, between Arches and say Azure or AWS? Or, um, one is the openness. We know that anything in Kubernetes, is, the whole stack is open source. So it, it means that uh, if we need to jump into the code to try and understand something, we can, which we've had to do in the past. Um, something odd happens or particular process. Um, I've been recently having fun trying to uh, resolve some issues with rollouts from major cloud vendors um, where they, we don't have insight into that. Um, and it's, uh, it's actually pushed me back on at least one project to, to using Kubernetes. Um, scalability, as I mentioned, um, it kind of forces us into that thinking of having stateless processes where possible, which are quite easy, easy to scale if we get 
you know, as, as use increases. Makes popping up lots of instances of, say, arches much easier, I think, um, in that we can say, here's our template, boom, 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 boom. Here we've got a whole load of them. Um, now, there is a question about how we uh, deal with creating new projects, and that's something that, that I think will be an ongoing discussion, hopefully, on the, on the lists. Um, but in terms of we want to uh, bring up a new version of this with maybe certain environments, variables changed or certain uh, config changed, it becomes quite quick. Um, resilience and consistency are quite closely linked. Um, having all of the infrastructure definition as code means that I can set up, let's say, go into Azure portal, no, there are ways of automating this too, but uh, go into Azure portal, click AKS, new cluster, and then fire this onto it, and everything else is in code. Um, everything else is in Git, everything else is versioned, it's recorded, it's auditable, it's traceable, um, and if it goes down, Kubernetes has all of that code to tell it how to bring things back up. So it's been fantastic for, for those two. Okay, so uh, enough slides. I'm going to attempt to find my screen. Here it is. And uh, let's see, let's a little bit here. Preference benefits. Um, <clears throat> there we go. So uh, this is on um, GitHub. Um, as I say, it's still a little bit rough around the edges, so uh, please do bear that in mind. Um, but Helm dash arches under our flex and tail repo. Um, what we've got here is <coughs> a Helm chart, and a Helm chart, as I mentioned, is a template. As a template, um, it's got a bit of definition information, so we say, okay, this is a uh, an Arches project, a Helm chart, um, what's it for, um, a bit about versions, that kind of metadata. So that's all recorded somewhere. And then within uh, within that, we've also, well, yes, we've also got dependencies. So how did I get RabbitMQ running? Well, I put it down as a dependency. And just like we were in Python, or uh, admittedly a little bit more around variable setting, but um, as if we were looking at a Python dependency or a JS dependency. We can pull those in. We're no longer having to maintain separate how do we set up Postgres um, kind of plans. Okay. And within the templates, uh, we've got um, some of those things that I showed earlier. Uh, for example, we have a config that will pull in uh, into environment variables, so our config settings. We can have secrets. Um, obviously, some things we don't want to be visible in normal config. Um, such as DB passwords and so forth. Those can be injected as files. So as far as the running process is concerned, it just sees another file sitting around the place. Um, and it's it's content that it's um, it thinks it's happily running on your local Docker um, or a VM Docker. But in reality, it's being magically floated around the place by Kubernetes. And um, we can also uh, have our workers running. So um, that's something where we can do, say, well, workers and cron jobs. Um, these aren't all web serving processes. Um, we can add these in and, like I say, templating config. Um, I don't think I've really got time to go into syntax too much, but at least uh, so that you can see um, how some of those things are linked together there. For example, we're pulling in uh, the couch DB password um, and we're pulling it in from are standards uh, from a secret and Kubernetes will keep track of that. And when that changes, then the CouchDB password will change as seen by um, Arches. So <clears throat> we can even do things like uh, look at how much uh, or what the resources being set um, given to each process are, and that will help Kubernetes decide if it's got six VMs, for example, available to it how it distributes all of those processes. Um, we don't need to worry about that. We just need to say this needs um, half a gig or this needs 100 meg. And Kubernetes will magically put it in a sensible place. So <clears throat> uh, we've had to do a little bit of um, playing around with uh, the 
Docker files and project creation. And uh, oh, sorry, I must I'll come back to the question. So, um, so some of that we've got um, a couple of extra bits for uh, pulling in entry points and making sure that we've got everything that's necessary within that container. One of the things that we do like to do with Kubernetes is make sure that we don't have uh, don't have to have a root user um, just as an added safety layer. Um, so getting any um, of that config set up and making sure that it's fully able uh, to get all of its config either from files or from uh, environment variables. And the rest should, it's fairly standard, um, nothing too dramatic. Um, and the next thing we know, we've got um, something that we can build, push to Docker, um, Docker Hub, or uh, say, for example, Azure Container Registry, and Kubernetes will happily pull it in and run it for us. So um, I'm obviously happy to go uh, spend more time in the code, more time in the questions, more time in the future bits. Um, uh, there's a, a couple of the questions in the chat as well, but I'm also aware that I am probably pretty tight for time. So uh, I thank you very much, um, Dennis. And yeah, um, happy to take any questions if we time or at the end. Great, thanks to all. That was super cool, and um, appreciate you going through in such a nice, organized fashion. It's really super interesting. There's, I think, an also an interesting question from Adam Cox about Ansible. And Adam, I guess I'll leave it to you. Do you want to, since you're the next presentation, would you like to do your presentation first and come back to this question, or would you prefer to? get the question out of the way, and then just move into your presentation. I would love to hear the answer to the question while this presentation is fresh on everyone's mind. Great. Maybe, Phil, maybe you could do just a, a quick, um, give a quick little summary of whether you looked at Ansible or not, and what your, if you if you did do so, kind of what your thoughts were. Yeah, sure. Um, so I guess Kubernetes, fits somewhere a little bit in between. Um, there's a bit, I suppose it combines some of what Ansible does, but not everything with some of what Docker Compose does, but not everything. And um, in some ways, I, I kind of feel that's underselling it, but um, I think it's a good way of thinking about it. What Kubernetes is trying to do is say, you, you don't want to be thinking about um, individual um, operations assets. So when I'm dealing with Kubernetes, um, everything that I've got defined here, there's no, no reference to what type of VMs or what's um, scale of infrastructure or anything like that. Kubernetes effectively is saying, um, how do I get this series of processes to run um, and everything else is kind of either someone else's problem or something it can do under the hood. So, <clears throat> um, I, so I've used uh, Ansible in the past. I do I actually really like Ansible. Um, but one of the combinations that I've used um, is uh, Terraform and Helm. And I think that kind of gives an idea that Helm, what we're looking at is the app structure. It makes sure that all of the app components are running. It doesn't uh, talk about um, what components in Azure, say, need to be running. And <clears throat> at, for example, at the Terraform end or at the Ansible end, um, you, can, um, you can make that um, explicit or you can leave it to be things that Kubernetes works out itself. So for example, if I say, I want to have an um, I want to have an ingress. So it's I want this particular um, service to get an IP address. Um, I, that's all I really need to tell Kubernetes, and all of the actual fine detail of how that happens, or who has to set up load balancers, or whether that load balancer needs to be connected to a certain uh, VPC, or um, according to your cloud provider. That's all handled by Kubernetes under the hood. 
So it's really about trying to, I think of it kind of as doing all of the building underneath that you have a nice flat level surface and that level surface is the same, whatever cloud platform you're using. There's no kind of thinking about operations. It's declare what processes, what processes I'm running, not what infrastructure I'm running. Does that, does that help a bit? Yeah, absolutely does. I think um, I've explored using Ansible a little bit with Arches, but um, I'm kind of seeing it fitting in a piece of what you've shown, but this is a more complete um, ecosystem, I suppose, would be the way to put it. Yeah, and I, I certainly know of people who use uh, Kubernetes and Ansible together. And so there, there are things like, say, for example, we're working on IoT solutions as well at times. And, mm -hmm. and you know, there's a lot of stuff there that maybe we want to bring up IoT Hub in, in Azure or something like that. Um, that isn't really something that Kubernetes, again, part of the point of Kubernetes is that it's focusing on, you know, on a, a cloud application. Mm -hmm. um, and so something else is bringing that that up. So it can sometimes be in, in partnership. Something like, I, I think something like Arches, we, we haven't hit any issues using Kubernetes on its own. Um, mm -hmm. But um, I suppose something creates a Kubernetes cluster um, and that could be clicking about three or four buttons in Azure portal, but equally, you know, that could be Ansible or, or Terraform. And obviously if, if you're wanting to have kind of production infrastructure, um, then I guess you want to have the Kubernetes set up also in infrastructure as code and, and that might be a small bit of Ansible or a small bit of Terraform to do that. Yeah. Great, thank you. Thanks, Phil. Thanks, Phil. Um, if you could stop sharing your screen, and Adam, if you wouldn't mind taking on um, screen sharing and uh, get yourself prepped for your presentation, just to, by way of introduction, Adam's going to be talking about work he's done with a group in Florida, and we're kind of back to a presentation about arches as a, as a particular solution. And um, I've been really looking forward to hearing the details of this for quite a while now. So Adam, thanks for offering to share your work and uh, please take it away. Okay, great. Um, thanks everybody. And the um, I've been excited to present this and um, it's extremely daunting. <laughs> There's so much to say about it. So I'm gonna try to, you know, fit in the amount of time and also, um, give a little bit of the um, interesting details about this project. So um, the project is called, or the program is called Heritage Monitoring Scouts, and it is for the uh, Florida Public Archaeology Network, FPAN. And a uh, little bit about myself, I've been working with Arches since um, summer of 2014, and I've done a number of different installations for different um, folks. And I'm currently at school, um, getting a master's degree at LSU. And this is really the, this and one other project are the only things I continue um, to work on substantially with Arches at the moment. So um, here's a quick overview of the presentation. I just wanna give a little bit of background about the project and then some of the characteristics and custom features. Um, and then I'll dive a little bit more into how we handle archeological sites and then some diagrams for development and production workflows, which are, I think, pretty basic, but um, hopefully that'll be interesting to people. And then just a quick wrap up of what the current um, upgrades that are planned. So <clears throat> this Heritage Monitoring Scouts or HMS program is, like I said, part of FPAN. Um, you can go to the web, the FPAN website, just fpan.us. Um, Florida Public Archaeology Network, I, I will, I can't give a fair, you know, background on it because I don't know all the details, but I would say that few states in the U.S., I think, have such a great um, nonprofit uh, entity like this, and they're kind of a cluster of different offices around the state, and they do a lot of great public archaeology work. So I, I do recommend looking them up and, and learning more about different other projects. Here's the, um, the URL for our Arches implementation is hms.fpen.us. And the underlying program here is to use citizen engagement to get condition assessments of historical sites around the state. 
um, especially with regard to sea level rise, obviously Florida, lots of coast. Um, and additionally, they were very insistent, as you'll see, on um, making this something that state employees could use as well, and that's worked out great. A um, little bit of details about the database. Um, we built the, the project directly from the an existing historical um, database the, from the State Historic Preservation Office, FMSF, uh, Florida Master Site File. Um, and so there are six different types of resources in that database. For the HMS program, we took out three of those categories. And these are the numbers of, uh, you know, approximate numbers of how many resources there are. and. And this is, a, we also have some complicated filtering to take a very small portion of the historical structures from the state database. So we basically pulled all of those into ARCHES and then have a fourth um, category in ARCHES called Scout Reports. And these are condition assessment forms. Um, and as you can see in ARCHES Lingo, this was the creation of four different resource models. Um, and I used, um, since the beginning, resource instance um, value or nodes to connect stout reports with, um, well, not quite since the beginning, but to connect stout, stout reports with um, each, with the uh, archaeological or cemetery or historic structure site that is, um, that the report concerns. So a little background on how the um, FPAN folks found me was that I was helping in um, 2017, presented with uh, Annabelle at the uh, CAA in Atlanta, Georgia, and a couple folks from FPAN um, attended the workshop. And this was actually, I think, pre-Arches 4 at that moment, or is kind of a release um, timing, uh, just before the release, around the release. Um, so they were really interested in essentially using Arches to upgrade their existing HMS project. Um, they had one that had been working for, I don't actually know, maybe a few years, um, that used Google Sheets or Google Sheets and forms and photo submissions, et cetera. So this was an existing program and we were gonna use Arches as a kind of the 2.0 um, version. This came with a number of uh, special requirements and I'm gonna, these are the ones I'm going to talk about the most. These are the most important ones. Um, so they right off the bat wanted to wanted to make sure there were separate sign-in portals for scouts and for state land managers. Um, I would say that getting state manager buy-in was really important to them from the very beginning. And so we wanted to make something that kind of accommodated that. Um, in a way, it's is very cosmetic because we just wanted people to think they're signing in through different portals. I mean, they are signing in through different portals, but it gives the site a different feel is what they wanted. And then we also needed to support public sign up, um, which was something that Arches did not support at the time, but now does. Um, and then finally, uh, archeological sites are the point, you know, the kind of the core of this whole thing. And they required some pretty complex permissions, which Arches now supports some pieces of this. As you'll see, Arches supports some pieces of what I'm going to be showing um, or describing at least, um, but at the time didn't at all. So these were kind of new, um, new ground I had to figure out. Um, and I'll get into the permissions, especially I'll describe a little more. Um, first, in terms of the look and feel, um, we wanted to base this directly on their existing website. So you can see here um, the FPAN website, it's very nicely filled out, uh, lots of different regions and information about different regions. So, uh, you know, build from strength. So we wanted to build from this, uh, their uh, existing success and, and good branding. Um, so the first thing we did was kind of rebuild the Arches homepage um, significantly, obviously. Is, is very different. And so we kind of slapped a new set of templates on the front of Arches. Um, so it looks pretty native to their existing um, program. And you'll notice here, there's two different sign-in portals. This one on the left, it says Scout Portal. On, on the right, 
Um, I really should full screen this, but I had some issue. It didn't work. Okay, I hope you can see well enough. Um, at any rate, two different sign-in portals. Um, and going to those portals gives kind of a preview of the different CSS styles that we set up to uh, permeate through the app once someone is uh, signed in through that type of user account. So again, it's pretty cosmetic, but it, it was a very important aspect of the whole project to make to prioritize from the beginning. Um, what happens really in, on the template side is that a different CSS file is loaded um, based on who is requesting the template. And I now have thought of many better ways to do that. <laughs> but uh, this is what we have at the moment. And maybe sometime down the road, I'll be able to refactor that a little slicker. Um, so when a scout is signed in, this is kind of what it looks like. Just, you know, again, pretty basic CSS changes, but um, state users signed in would have different color scheme, et cetera. Okay, the, um, the thing I want to kind of give a pretty thorough description of, um, though it's overwhelmingly um, fragmented at this moment, <laughs> um, is how we handle archeological site permissions. Um, there are a couple of requirements for this. And so most importantly, the public can't view archeological sites and scouts can only view sites that they've been assigned to. This is kind of their existing workflow. So we wanted to stick with that workflow. Um, and then additionally, like I mentioned, we needed to accommodate state land managers. Um, so they needed to be able to see various subsets of all the archeological sites. Um, and this was something that we designed very, uh, I would just say much too specifically around the initial request. And later I've had to patch on, kind of change strategy. Adam, uh, I think we lost your audio there. Is anybody anybody hearing Adam? Oh, oh there we are. Not here. Oh, I see. Oh, there he is. There he is. My connection. Oh no, I'm sorry. No um, that was just a yeah. Um, is this slide familiar to you? <laughs> yeah, we we we've seen this slide, but we lost you. Um, we, we lost you sort of towards the end of your your discussion of the slide. Okay. Um, Okay, well then you didn't miss much. Um, at any rate, there's just different state land manager types of um, access that needed to be handled. So I wanted to figure out a way that could handle both of these uh, requirements, of course, you know, simplify as much as possible. Um, so what I came up with was building around a strategy which um, applies permissions based on user information compared to node values in the resource itself. Um, and ultimately, at its base, this has been a really good strategy, though there's plenty of extraneous things that still need to be uh, figured out, or not figured out, but um, fixed up, I would say, or kind of refactored. But um, ultimately, this accomplished both of these things because I was able to add a, a assigned to node for uh, resources or archeological sites so that an admin could change that node to equal the scout's name. And then the filter can just use the, uh, the username. Um, and then kind of the secondary version of this was to, for the land managers, I would associate um, location and then management agency information to, um, to each resource with the spatial join and then compare other aspects of the land manager users. So maybe not their name specifically, but the groups that they're a member of, et cetera. Um, and compare those to the values in the location or agency nodes. Um, ultimately, that's that continues to be the, um, the, the, the strategy. And what's, well, one note here, I found it quite difficult to um, apply these filters to only one resource model. 
And that was a lot of Elasticsearch wrangling, so to speak. Um, made it work, but that was a real that was a real challenge um, initially. Um, so ultimately, Arches, as you're all aware, shows uh, search results on the search page, but it also shows uh, tiles or um, vector tiles of resource locations. And so neither of those could be available to um, uh, Stouts or, or the public, et cetera. So two places the search filter had to be had to be used. Uh, one is in a trust some search component that is that affects the actual search results. And then what I've done is pull this API.mvt, I think that's the name of the class, um, straight into my app, and then really just passed in a where an extra where clause to the SQL that runs the MVT um, query to pull out a specific subset of um, geometries based on uh, different criteria. So this is this has been working since, well, for a while, I guess. Um, it's changed, obviously, the MVT. I had to have a different different strategy earlier on, but um, this has been the uh, strategy for, for a while now. Um, so I can do a, a, just a quick show of what this looks like. Oh, that's where it showed up. Um, so I have this running locally. Um, I'm signed in as an admin in this private window um, and signed in as a scout, CJ Morton, Chet Morton, um, example scout. So um, one thing to note right away, these are some demo sites basically, but um, search results are different here, um, even though there's really the same, um, I can't move that, the same uh, URLs basically are being used here. The one difference is there's a site filter, that's the custom search filter. So the workflow is that a, um, an admin here will find a site and then go to edit it. And this is where the um, the admin is allowed is able to choose a scout to assign the site. This is a custom widget. Um, not really time to talk about that, but um, ultimately that pulls from the list of scouts in the in the um, in the Django data ORM. So now that we've assigned that scout, so if we refresh the page, we'll now see um, this guy can now see his new. Um, the site he's been um, assigned. There's a lot of other ex extra things that could be added to this that we just haven't been able to get to. Um, so I, again, obviously, one big detail is the, um, this is 14.08 now, not 14.07. Uh, if we filter for archeological sites, we'll go to see this one. Um, and, um, the scout can now view the report for this site. And then we added a link in the report, which basically uh, the report for the site, which says uh, something like create report, which is really just a, uh, so create report. So this is just a shortcut really back to the normal um, creation method for a new scout report resource. So this is, that's kind of the workflow people come through. Um, like I mentioned, there's a lot of extra stuff that could be done. We could trigger, we should trigger emails so that scouts will know when a new site is, uh, you know, assigned to them, et cetera. Um, but there's a lot to, um, a lot to figure out just to get um, this far. And I won't demo the uh, state land manager permissions, um, but, whether it's a little easier for them anyway because they are not waiting to be assigned a site they just um can you know sort by archaeological site and then they'll be seeing all of the sites within their park um okay so i'll jump back to now the larger presentation um, so um I guess I'm doing okay on time. I wanted to just talk a little bit about um, some of my uh, standards of practice, I guess, at this point for um, development and deployment. Um, this is probably very, very familiar to most of you, um, but just wanted to uh, put it up there to show the, um, the way that I 
handle these uh, this type of development. So, and and especially for this project, but this is I guess what I use in general too. Um, so, as you're all familiar with, um, we have the core arches code, the project code, and then the in this case the package, which I've called FPAN data. So these are all different repos, um, and I guess I just wanted to show that this allows the exact same um, code to be deployed to the staging server as well as to the production server. So it's very easy to make the changes locally, test all I want, and then also push them up and deploy it just to the staging server first. This is really important, not only to see what happens once it's you know up on a server, that's not my laptop, but also because then I can show it to um, the clients and they can have a look at it and uh, test new functionality, test new features. It's also especially important because we're dealing with archaeological sites. And so, you know, this is um, sensitive data and we have not had any problems with it, of course, knock on wood, which I'm doing right now. But um, we've kept it all very safe. And part of that is having a good deployment strategy. Um, so once, you know, once it's been deployed and tested on the staging server, then kind of follow the exact same uh, pulls and deployments uh, to push it into the production server. It's relatively low tech setup, I guess, um, but it's certainly sufficient for this project. Um, wanted to mention just a little bit about the difference between the project and the package. Um, I won't go through all these points. They're kind of um, basic or known to you. Um, but for a very long time, I really managed the package closely and made sure that it was a very close, uh, you know, could reproduce all of the content of the uh, database. And for the most part, that's still true. I still, we still push changes from resource models back into the package so that they stay in one place and can be redeployed at any at any time. Probably the biggest difference is that I we initially had a whole and still do have a whole set of state user accounts that we needed to make. Um, and I've moved away from trying to make sure that those are always mirrored in the package. Um, I had some sort of complex scripts that would, you know, list run through lists and create users um, and assign groups, etc. Um, but as we're moving forward with this, we just need a lot more flexibility with state manager accounts. So, um, and I'll talk about that in a little bit here, um, but that kind of, so I've kind of dropped off trying to manage, especially keeping all the user accounts faithful in the package, but, um, but otherwise, um, otherwise I still keep everything in there, of course, to, at least the base information and some sample, but of course, no, no real archeological data. Um, this is the current production setup that, that, um, that we're using. Um, it's evolved a little bit over the last few years. Um, I guess I didn't mention this earlier, but it was in 2017, we started this kind of in the summer and I think our soft release was February, 2018. So it's been in production for a couple of years. Um, and there's, a, let's see, a couple of things to say about this. Reusing the Postgres and Elasticsearch servers, really useful, um, really helpful. And additionally, because um, this Elasticsearch server is used by a ton of other projects that I have. So, um, so it's been nice to be able to reuse those. And um, I would also mention that we, a long time ago, again, we were setting up email from this app to accommodate the Scout signup before that was really baked into Arches at all. Uh, we set up a local server on the uh, production server um, using Postfix, and I would not do that again, <laughs> only because SendGrid is a much easier uh, client to use and uh, for, for managing email. Other people probably have other ideas too or other solutions. So managing an email server on top of your production server, it's not like it requires a lot of management, but it's um, probably best not to um, add that to the stack. Um, and then we use S3 buckets for uploaded media like photographs and then also to um, store backup files from the database, which run um, daily. 
Um, I thought I'd just mention the cron jobs that we use on the production server. Frankly, we could add a number more of more ones, which um, the ones I would add after some testing would be some Postgres manage, like basically Postgres cleanup, like the vacuum uh, commands and session clearing session log commands, et cetera. So, so there's some, some maintenance stuff that really could be added to this, but right now there's just four in use. Um, we use uh, CertBot for the SSL certificate, so something to uh, regularly renew that. Um, uh, server reboot, which I added that a long time ago after I found some Apache. There was some Apache crash that would happen and a reboot would fix it. It just reboots in the middle of the night. Um, and like I mentioned, we have a backup, daily backup that runs and, and then pushes the backup file to S3. Those are just kind of PG dump tar, tar files from the uh, database. And then I've kind of started to build out some email reporting. Um, so made this one email that sends weekly that says how many new reports have been made. Plenty, plenty more work to do that could really make that a lot better. Um, and so now here, um, just to give a really quick uh, overview of what I have in progress kind of or in store, so to speak. Um, the land manager account system is really ballooned since the initial creation of the project and the initial requirements. So I'm gonna be refactoring that. And essentially my plan is to build out a new user profile that has some more attributes in it. And so I can push a lot more standardized information into one user profile and get away from using uh, groups the Django groups, which is not really the best way to handle some of this. Um, and then uh, merge that profile into the current Arches user profile page. Um, I'm also looking at uh, redoing or adding geo permissions so that um, the idea is to be able to add Django fixtures, uh, which are the park boundaries, so to speak, and then or any other unit boundaries, and then attach those boundaries to the user profile and run some run an additional set of filters on the um, on the boundaries that are attached to the user requesting the page. Um, and one of the biggest reasons for this is that the staff at FPAN are very comfortable using the Django admin. So this would give them better control over adding new users and then assigning those unit users um, land management units or groups of units. And then uh, finally, we, it's been an issue for a while is that the, stream, the Scout signup that we created um, works fine, but it's not the best uh, workflow. It's a little bit circuitous. So probably refactoring that it, either into the current Arches um, setup or, or at least just fixing it up a little more to make it, um, make it better. Um, there's, uh, like I mentioned earlier, plenty of other topics to talk about. I've done a lot of different pieces of this project to accommodate and kind of build out different aspects of the entire thing. But I think I'm probably about time is up and um, wanted to get to questions um, if anybody has any. Hey, thanks, Adam. That was really great. I appreciate that. Yeah, no problem. I hope my internet wasn't going in and out the whole time. That's pretty uh, unfortunate. No, we just lost you for that one moment. So it was okay, actually good. All right. Um, I do have a question that I'd like to pose, but I want to also let people know that we're we have about fifteen or so minutes left in our in our meeting today, and I do want to open it up to a broader some broader participation. So if you have a question or a comment or maybe a proposal for what we should do in our next meeting or if we should have a next meeting or if so, when should that happen? Um, please don't be shy. Feel free to unmute yourself and, and jump in to the conversation. But while you're working up your courage, I'll ask Adam kind of one quick thing, which is the, this idea of using geometry to manage permissions to specific instances it's something that we've been thinking about for a while as well. And it comes up pretty regularly from the user community. And I'm, I guess I'm curious to hear a little bit more about the approach you're taking. One of the things we're worried about is 
models with multiple geometry nodes, right? And how you'd manage permissions based on nodes in, um, you can actually have multiple geometry nodes in a single branch. So ha have you been thinking about it at that level or are you still in sort of the early stages of your thought? Yeah, I, I've tested the things that I need to have happen um, and basically they work. Like I mentioned, what really is difficult is applying or ha I have found difficult is applying these permissions to only one resource model. Um, but yeah, ultimately I'll just show the quick, um, the, like I mentioned, two places that that needs to happen. Injecting extra SQL into the API um, MVT, MVP class or MVT class proved pretty easy. And so in this case, you can see this code. Um, I'm pulling from this management area model, which has a geometry attached, um, and then adding this where clause, which is just a post GIS intersect um, based on the uh, geometry in that model. Um, and then this just gets injected right in here. So this would, I think, handle what you're talking about, where this is just pulling, um, it's down to the resource, the tile uh, geometry, not the resource instance uh, name. And it's also by node ID, of course, which is, which was my biggest um, concern in this, in this case, because of, um, well, it's not the biggest concern, it's one of them, because this is just the uh, driving the vector tiles. Um, so this, I was just working on this this past week. It works fine. There's plenty more to do to, um, you know, this is only proof of concept. Um, and then in terms of uh, uh, on the other side, affecting the search results themselves, um, I was able to use basically the same, um, the same logic to pull a feature geometry and then push it into um, the search query. And this works, uh, I was just reading, I was pulled this straight from the, basically straight from the map filter search, the, uh, the Arches map filter. Um, and so I, this is where I'm at with these things. And you can see it's pulling from a, a Django ORM object. Um, and so there's plenty, like I said, plenty more to do to really combine all, to actually make this uh, what I want. But and, and also to apply this to only one graph ID is not, is obnoxiously difficult. <laughs> but um, anyways, uh, yeah, I hope that answers uh, your question. I don't know that this is filling all of the use cases you've been talking about, but again, this is kind of coming from, okay, we've been expanding the conditions for permissions for a long time and um, and this is my kind of new idea for, for fixing up some of the long-term patches that I've had to make. Cool, oh, thanks, yeah, that's really illustrative. I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just looking at our chat window here and there is a new question from David Myers at the Getty about uh, this Arches Esri integration. And he's asking if we can provide a bit of a bit some information about where things stand with that and I'd be happy to start that and Andy if you want to jump in when I'm done you please feel free to do so for those of you who are unaware of what we're talking about here we've been working on uh, a real-time integration between Arches and Esri's desktop GIS product specifically ArcGIS Pro and we've built an add-in that you can install in ArcGIS Pro that lets you uh, access Arches data directly from within the Esri product. So you can pull in Arches uh, model instances as feature classes, sort of native feature classes in, in Esri, and you can create new geometries and new instances inside of ArcGIS Pro and then upload them to Arches. And then in fact, open up the Arches user interface within the Esri product and uh, take advantage of the Arches UI to build out the, all the rich detail of a new instance. So that's, that's what we're doing in a nutshell. 
Um, hopefully that gives you a sense of what we're trying to accomplish. It's really making it possible to create and update instances, specifically the geometries of instances in arches, but using native Esri tools and have that work really in a very seamless way. And the, I guess the state of the, the state of the, the work is that that's, that's really running at the moment. It seems functional. There are a number of folks at Historic England who have been doing testing with it. We've identified a, a relatively small number of little bugs and uh, technical issues that we're currently looking at how to resolve. But the bottom line is we expect that this add-in will be available for just sort of general use in the, real, in the, in the near term. Um, it is it's on GitHub, it's public, the code base is publicly available. So there's nothing stopping you from looking at it and, and, and jumping in and testing it if you want to. A couple caveats, it does require Arches version 5.1, 5 at least, I, maybe even 5.1, I'm not 100% sure. I can't remember off the top of my head. And it requires ArcGIS Pro. Uh, it uses a, a it has a, a new dependency, um, something called Coop, which is an open source product that was written by Esri that lets you take GeoJSON endpoints and process them into, Nesri, into native Esri feature services. So that's a new requirement to support this. Uh, that's also a publicly available repo in GitHub. So if you're at all interested in this, give us a shot, we can get you started in the right direction. Um, Andy, do you have anything to add to that? Not really, I think that was pretty comprehensive. I think just to clarify that the coop element you you, uh, you guys had working at version 5.0, um, but but the add-in is, is, is for 5.1, so. Uh, right. But yeah, no, everything, everything you said is, uh, is fine. Yeah, we're just assisting with the testing, um, just, just to help you guys along. Uh, and one thing I would point out here is uh, it's a good example of how, like, how much better a product becomes when we work together. One of the things we did early on was um, hear from Historic England on what, the, on what the requirements were for this. I think Andy and his group looked at how to implement this. Uh, we looked at how to implement it. I think we came up with a pretty good solution, uh, testing this, one of the things that fell out of it was a particular network configuration inside of HE, which Andy was good enough to look at and resolve and could um, provided a, a fix to the code to deal with some network configuration issues within HE in a very, I think, generic way. Um, to me, that's a really great example of why we do it the way we do it, right? Which is, um, look for specific use cases and the opportunity to partner with people who are implementing arches so that not only we write in the code, but we can, we can deploy it and test it in a way that is you know, reasonable and, and gets to like, sort of the core thing, which is something that works generically, but also within a specific, sort of within the specific constraints of, of like in this case, HE. Um, I do want to make sure that we uh, open up the conversation. If you, if, you've, if you have any questions about what you saw today, again, please don't hesitate to, uh, to chime in. But uh, one of the things I do want to ask the group is uh, whether this was a useful use of time. I mean, I realize that it's a bit challenging to get everybody to sit down in front of their computers at the same time, given the time zones that separate us. Uh, it'd be great to hear from you whether this second Arches developer meeting was, was worth it for you. Uh, and if it was, um, would it make sense to do a third meeting? And if so, what, what should we talk about in the third meeting? Would it be best to, continue on in this vein where we share, where participants share the work that they're doing? Would it make more sense to have uh, meetings that 
are more interactive where we talk about deployments and or code or specific topics in code. Um, I'm kind of open to any of those things, but hearing from you all what you think might be most useful would certainly be helpful. I think, um, sorry, Dennis, it's Andy. Um, one of the things I think that we had a few years ago was we, we kind of all got together in, in Swindon in the UK and had a, had a had a training session which you know we, uh, some of your guys um rob and cyrus came over and, and and took us through some really interesting stuff and i'm wondering whether maybe um kind of a, a future um a future event could could potentially have something less along the lines of you know this is what we're doing but maybe more along the lines of um, this is an example of, of some of the stuff you could do and here you know maybe a run through of doing developing some of the some of the extensions you can do in arches yeah yeah i i agree that would be really cool and and meeting in person lends itself to that um i think maybe more so than a zoom call but when the world allows us to get back together again in the same place at the same time, I'd be super up for that. Um, you know, we'd originally had the idea of hosting something like that in San Francisco and that and it looked like there was interest in that. That of course, there's some challenges with that. I mean, getting the money and the time set aside to actually make the trek to a place like San Francisco or London or New York or Louisiana, wherever we'd end up doing it, does, I think, somewhat limit the participation. But I think it's really valuable to be able to sit down and share code, share ideas, uh, talk about what's possible with Arches, and then actually sit down and write a bit of code to explore whether ideas you know, could actually be implemented. So I'm down with that for sure. It'd be great to be able to do that. Um, and if there's a way to do it remotely before we can all be in the same place at the same time, I'm, I'm pretty open to it. I mean, do you, Andy, do you have, do you have some ideas about how we might do that in the near term? Um, uh, <laughs> no, um, I mean, maybe, maybe not a webinar, uh, you know, this is, quite useful to kind of see what what everyone is doing and really kind of get a flavor for it maybe as as a kind of a separate exercise perhaps you could you know we could run things um maybe uh kind of community-led maybe recorded stuff because obviously sometimes it's it's not particularly useful to have everyone come together live to watch someone do some coding perhaps maybe it's it's actually uh, something that could be done sort of separately rather than the, the regular meetups uh, but but until until there's a vaccine i think we're going to be um kind of struggling to meet up in person yeah I, I mean i think that's that's right i i do think a smaller group of people could probably uh do what you suggest which is have a, a you know a conversation with sharing screens and writing code in a in a collaborative way to explore whether you know particular set of new functions could be implemented or test, you know, ideas, that would be possible. And there's certainly nothing stopping groups of people doing that. Uh, it would be great if that does happen to do a recording and make that publicly available or somehow summarize what was done and share that back with the community. I mean, that's, that would be, a, that'd be really, really good. And I think super useful. I mean, it goes to, I think, a bigger point here, which is I'm actually really very, very excited with the level of interest there is in Arches and the number of really interesting implementations that are go on, ongoing. I mean, we saw three today that were really, really cool. And it feels like there's a bit of momentum starting to build up around developers who are doing uh, interesting things with Arches and and I know there are others that, that didn't get a chance to present today. Um, I would just, I guess I would just be really in favor of having people post back to the community the work that they're doing or little technical breakthroughs that they've made just as a way of starting um, conversations amongst yourselves. Because I think that is one of the key things about it. 
about a, a healthy developer community is the willingness to you know, share and, and explore together. And I feel like we're really close to that. Dennis, this is this is Adam. I think um, I I don't know. I'm preparing for this presentation today, um, I feel like I could do 40 more, <laughs> and I think everyone probably could because there's just so many different pieces to talk about, and so many different, of course, different installations by you know by different people, and people do things differently, of course. So, um, part of me likes the idea of doing this exact same thing in a few months and just finding three more people. Um, I, and not not um, and maybe that sounds basic, but um, this worked out I think pretty well, and I just think there's so many more people to hear from that I, you know, it could be a specific topic or it could be here's this installation that that I did. So um, I guess I'm just saying I'm I'm all for more, and I think that there's plenty more um, to talk about. Yeah, I I agree, Adam. I mean, we, you know, we. I made a, a decision to not show off any of the stuff that we're doing because I felt like there was already enough being done that would have just would have been too too much in one meeting. But I think it would have been e it, it would be easy to do this again in say uh, late winter or early spring next year, so like March ish time frame. Uh, and I I think we'd have little trouble in finding three more projects to, to highlight and, and talk about. And I'm happy to, I'm, I'm happy if that's the case. Um, it'd be good to hear again, more broadly from the folks on the call today, whether that would be something that would be considered useful and, and helpful. And um, I'm sensitive to the time that we've got. I mean, it's been two hours and I know from personal experience how hard it is to sit through a two hour, web meeting, so I don't want to drag this on. But what I will say is a thing that you could do would be to get on the developer forum and provide some feedback about what went well today, what didn't go as well as it could have gone, and what you'd like to see in the next developer meeting. And it doesn't have to be a, doesn't have to be a book. It could literally be a couple bullets like, hey, today's meeting was fine, uh, and the next meeting it would be great to have three more presentations. That'd be a perfectly useful and helpful piece of feedback. Equally helpful would be, you know, today was a good was a good try. Here's what didn't work as well as it might have. Here's some suggestions for what you might think of for the next meeting. And we'll take those just as seriously as the, hey, it was a good job. So if you do have an opinion, please go to the forum and let us know if this was helpful or not. And also, uh, give us a sense as, as to whether the time frame for the next meeting makes sense. I will just, I'll just throw out that uh, March seems like a reasonable time to consider an, the next meeting. If that seems too early, too soon, or too too long of a wait, uh, again, just give us a sense of that in the, in the developer forum. So. I'd appreciate that. I'm sure the rest of the speakers would as well. Um, with that, I'm gonna, I guess I'm gonna invite any last comments. If you have something that you're really burning to say, please feel free to unmute yourself. Um, and if we don't hear any more, let's just maybe put a bow around this today. I thought it was really great. Kudos to all the speakers. I felt like, each of the presentations was super interesting and it was really, really inspiring to see the work that's being done on the platform. I can just, I know I can speak for the Farallon team in saying that seeing the work that you're putting into the platform and the investments you're making in both time and, and resources is, uh, it just speaks volumes to the good work that you're doing. So really appreciate that. Um, and I'll just say, once again, thanks everyone for participating and we'll talk to you again in 2021. Thanks, Dennis. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, thanks.